Okay. Hello and welcome to our Astrophysics Weekly Colloquium. And uh, it is a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Ritesh Ghosh from NASA Goddard today. And I would uh, like to invite Professor Ritovan Chatterjee, who has been a collaborator uh, of Dr. Ghosh for a long time, to introduce the speaker. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Chetana. So, Ritesh uh, did his uh, undergraduate, both uh, bachelor's and master's from uh, Vishwavarati, and then uh, um, joined Vishwavarati itself for PhD, although he did most of his work with uh, Professor Gulab Devangan at Ayuka. And after finishing his PhD, while he was waiting a long time for the after the submission of the thesis and the defense, there was a one and a half year gap, partly because of pandemic and partly because of just general delay. See, he also became a school teacher for, for like a year or so. But then he went back to Ayuka as a postdoc. And then from there, he is now a postdoc at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And Ritesh uh, has been working uh, for most of his career on, on research career on uh, X-ray uh, spectral analysis of active galactic nuclei. So Ritesh is actually um, one of the top experts that I know of among uh, you know, X-ray spectral data analysis and uh, AGN uh, X-ray spectra. And uh, so that's what he's uh, applying uh, at, uh, at uh, Goddard now. Um, I, I'll just tell one story because it's uh, customary to tell one story in introduction. So Ritesh, I, I met Ritesh at Ayuka in one of our uh, associate visits to Ayuka. And I realized that he is an expert on X-ray spectra. And I work on X-ray variability, but not that much on spectra. So I wanted uh, some of our students to learn about the X-ray spectral analysis using x and uh, such things. So I invited Ritesh for for a, like a one day visit at presidency. And he came and he sort of gave a talk on his work in our sort of in our group, uh, because we uh, only invite people who have a PhD for the colloquium. So we could not invite Ritesh at that time for a colloquium, but we I invited for a talk in our group meeting and he gave the talk. And then he had like a small workshop with some of our students on the X-ray spectral analysis. And uh, so it was, he did a very good job. And uh, I mean, the reason I'm saying he did a very good job, not because, I mean, I am not a judge because I'm not an expert, but at that time, people who were doing research with me, some of the undergraduate students, they were one of the most peaky students of the world. Uh, they did not, well, they, they often complained about some things was not clear, some uh, explanation was not good enough, or the thing was not intellectual enough, and so on and so forth. But even they actually came back to me later and said that Ritesh Da did a very good explanation and we really understood what's going on. He even explained things that uh, sort of questions that we did not come up with questions, but he anticipated some questions that this may be a problem. So he explained those. So after getting the certificate from those really peaky, snooty students, I realized that Ritesh actually did a very good job. So I hope I'm sure that Ritesh is continuing to be an expert on uh, X-ray data analysis. And he will talk about a uh, very sort of interesting aspect of AGN uh, uh, sort of variability, I would say, that has come up in the last, I'd say, decade or so, uh, maybe less than a decade that some AGNs are changing too much. And so he will try to explain why, what is actually happening. So Ritesh. Yep. Thank you, Ravanda. It's, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the kind words. Um, thank you, Sustanadi, for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, really nice to be here again. And uh, I'll be talking about, as Ritamanda mentioned, uh, it's changing look AGNs. Now it's a rare subclass of AGNs. I'll talk about it in details. So currently I'm a postdoc at uh, NASA GSFC. And uh, okay. 
Oh. Okay, yes. Yeah, yes. my God. Thanks. Okay, so uh, whatever I'll be talking about is uh, mostly we have done this and published papers on this. And there are two papers. If you want, if you want to go through that, you can go through these papers. There are links that are provided there. So uh, these are the two papers that are published last year, and one of them is uh, we have submitted to the FJ, and hopefully it will be uh, get accepted really soon. These are the collaborators that uh, I work with, Shivashis and Ognivo. They are alumni of residency, so it's, uh, uh, again, residency is involved in this very much. And uh, so uh, this is the overview of the talk. So first I'm gonna talk about active galactic nuclei, what are those things and their classifications. Then uh, I'll talk about the changing look agents, the rare subclass, as I mentioned before, what are these? And then I'll talk about two specific cases that are really interesting and doesn't quite follow the, uh, the idea that we have of changing look agents and why they are so unique. So these are the two sources, Mercury 590 and 1ES 1927 plus 654. Okay. So uh, let's start with AGNs. Uh, so, really, so as you can see here, this is a picture. Of course, it is an artistic impression, but you get the idea. So there is a supermassive black hole at the center. As you know, there are uh, current, it was a belief. Now we have pictures of sort. So there is a supermassive black hole at the center and uh, it uh, creates matter. And this matter gets yet heated and emits. And uh, as you can see here, so this is the part that is shown as the supermassive black hole, the singularity as in the center. And then we have uh, the accretion disk, which is basically the accreted matter, which just uh, cannot just go fall into the supermassive black hole because of the conservation of angular momentum. It creates an accretion disk and this disk gets heated and emits radiations. And there is also another part that is very interesting that is corona, which is uh, the name is given because of its similarity to the sun which is basically a high, uh, highly energetic plasma as of sort, which emits huge amount of radiations in X-rays. And that's why this is very important to X-ray astronomers. And also there are other uh, parts of it, AGNs, for example, the outer part of the accretion disk forms a dusty torus, which is uh, basically a shape of a donut-like structure. And then sometimes you have jets. For example, this is shown in this direction on the particular direction, as you can see here from both directions sometimes, but these jets are relatively rare. And uh, of course, only seven or 8% of agents show these jets. And of course, there are regions which are called BLR, broad line region, narrow line region, which is basically the clouds which resides very close to the supermassive black hole. And they're depending on its proximity, it's called either broad line region or narrow line region. So if it is farther away from the AGN, it's called narrow line region. If it is close to the supermassive black hole, it's called BLR region. Okay, so the interesting thing about uh, these AGNs are, sorry. So the interesting thing about these AGNs is their luminosity. So they are spatially unresolved, which means even with the state of the art telescope that we have, for example, Chandra, we cannot specially resolve these agents and their central regions. But interestingly, this central region, which is less than one percent, is emitting the same amount of energy, which is comparable to the entire galaxy. And sometimes it is even thousand times larger than the galaxy. And this is the most interesting part. And that's why we believe that this is a supermassive black hole and accreting matter, which is responsible for this amount of energy. Otherwise, we would not have this amount of energy coming out from this so, I mean, so small region, right? So uh, this is uh, spatially unresolved and this is very highly luminous. And sometimes we see jets. Okay. Okay. So these are some interesting features of AGNs. For example, on the right-hand side, you can see this is a normal galaxy, spectra from the normal galaxy, which is basically the black body emissions from stars. And if you sum up them, it will look something like this. But when you are looking at AGN spectra, the remarkable thing is that it's almost consistent throughout the frequency band. So as you can see here in the radio band, it is coming down because most of the AGNs are not radio loud. Uh, at least as you as already mentioned, it's around seven to 10%. But if you are looking at radio loud AGN, 
you will see something like this. So it will be a little uh, curvature, a little, little less in this part. And another interesting thing is, as I mentioned, is the emission lines, broad emission lines in the optical spectra, as well as in the X-ray spectra that we usually don't see in any other galaxies. So for example, if you look at this, uh, this is uh, type one and type two agents. I'll come back to that later. So these are the optical spectra of agents. And these are Baumann emission lines for each alpha and H beta Baumann emission lines. And these are very important, uh, important features of AGN, which we use to study these AGNs, their central regions, and the regions that are emitting in the optical and X-rays. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the AGN SED, and uh, I'm talking about, I'll be talking about optical UV and X-ray mostly. So let's uh, see where this is coming from, this emission. So as I already mentioned, this is the, there's some BH, a supernancy black hole, there's an accretion disk. Now this accretion disk emits in UV. It mostly emits in UV up to, uh, it may be up to 100 RG or 1000 RG. Uh, then there is a corona, as I already mentioned, it emits in X-rays. Now this emission from X-ray, uh, from corona, which is called the primary power law continuum, it sometimes enters the accretion disk and it, uh, as you know, that ionized, it may be ionized in the central region on the central, the, the accretion disk that is close to the central region is ionized most of the time. So this ionized accretion disk will emit a lot of fluorescent emission lines. And these emission lines gets blurred and smoothened by the extreme gravity of the uh, central supermassive black holes. And it produces this soft excess region, which is below 2 keV. Now I'm talking about the X-ray part here. And there you can see this is the power law continuum, which is emitted from this corona. The soft excess is supposed to be emitting from the uh, ionized accretion disk. And also, as you can see here in the around 10 keV part, above 20 to 30 keV here, we see Compton hump. What is this? If this is basically the Compton downscattering of the high energy photons by the torus. So we get a bump-like structure here and a bump-like structure in the uh, soft texture part. So this is the soft texture part and this is the around 20 kV or 30 kV. So you see these two features there. And sometimes uh, you see a broad F emission line, which is also supports the idea of this uh, parallel continuum getting reflected or uh, from the ionized accretion disk and emitting broad F emission line. But in most AGNs, we at least see a narrow emission line, narrow FE emission line. Now, why FE? Because of its abundance, of course. So we see this narrow emission line around 6.4 keV. And sometimes, as I mentioned, if the reflection is dominated from the accretion disk, we see a broad FE emission line around 6.4 keV region. So this is the part we, uh, so this is the exit part. And also in the UV, as you can see here, this is mostly emitted from the accretion disk itself. Now, there may be some contribution from the borderline region, uh, but it mostly dominated by the optical emission from the accretion disk. But what is the blue dotted line on the left side? Oh, this is uh, actually, it's taken from the paper. So this is the power law continuum extrapolated. So it's not a uh, continuum emission it's from, time. yeah, just extrapolation. Okay. So, uh, Initially, it was uh, the agents were classified based on their luminosity. So how luminous they are. So uh, Seifert galaxies um, named after Carl Seifert. Uh, so it was low redshift. It was found for most of the uh, Seifert galaxies. They are low redshift and they are low luminous. Now, low luminous means it's almost comparable to the entire galaxy. Now, for quasars, on the other hand, which are more luminous, and they are found to be at the high redshift part of the uh, galaxy, and their luminosity most of the time are found to be almost 100 times greater than the normal galaxies. So as you can see here, it's greater than 10 to the 46 hours per second. Now, uh, Seifert galaxies are usually found in spiral galaxies and quasars in elliptical galaxies. And uh, usually, as I previously mentioned, they are not radio, uh, usually radio quiet, not radio loud. And quasars are relatively uh, radio loud comparable to the Seifert galaxies. 15 to 20% of times. Uh, now, the next part is the optical spectra based classifications. Now, uh, AGNs were initially classified based on ground 
based telescopes because we didn't have any you know uh, space based telescope then so whatever classifications are made are based on these ground based telescopes so we had optical and radio right so for optical as i have uh, shown before these are the broad emission lines and narrow emission lines so when we see both broad and narrow emission lines in the agn spectra we call them or we term there was a type 1 agn or cfat 1 agn and when you see only narrow emission lines, now the narrow emission lines means the FW image is of the order of 500 kilometer per second. And when you're talking about broad emission lines, it's of the order of 2000 kilometer per second. Now, obviously in uh, the latest stage, people have uh, different classifications, for example, CFAT 1.2, 1.4 and so on, depending on the FW image, okay? Uh, so these are the uh, classification based on optical spectra. Uh, now, this is the radio power-based classification. So, what is, uh, it is termed radio loudness. So, radio loudness is basically the ratio of the luminosity at 5 gigahertz and the optical 440 angstrom. And if it is greater than 10, we term them as radio loud. And if it is not, then we call them radio quiet. So, it is basically radio quiet and radio loud. And also, radio loud agents are, depending on the morphology, they are further classified into FR1 and FR2. So, for example, this is a uh, FR2 uh, radio loud source. And as you can see here, the jet from the central region or the central galaxy is almost reaching up to megaparsec scale. So, this is very unique. And uh, this is an example of FR2 uh, radio loud agent. Okay. So, and also I forgot to mention that the origin of this jet, which is very interesting, the origin of the jets and the collimation of the jet, because it, Obviously, these must be really collimated, right? And we need huge amount of power to boost this amount of uh, these jets up to this megaparsec scale. So, what is the origin of this energy? What is some uh, what are responsible for this? Whether this is black hole spin or the magnetic field, this is still in debate. Okay. So, um, next is uh, AGN classifications. We talked about classifications. Next is the unification model. So the idea is, uh, it was in 1993 that Antonacci and Pradhamani, they came up with an idea that, okay, let's some uh, try to unify all these aspects of agents, right? So we have these broad emission lines, we have narrow emission lines, we have jets. So what they suggested that it's an orientation-based unification scheme. So where, how you're looking at it, it depends on this orientation of the inclination angle. So for example, if you are looking at this uh, central region from an age on view or the inclination angle is very high, then your view will be blocked by this torus, right? And that's why the BLR region, which is very close to the uh, supermassive black hole will be blocked. And this region is responsible for the broad emission lines. So that's why broad emission lines will not be visible to you. But the narrow line region, which is farther away from the central region will be visible and narrow emission lines are present in the optical spectrum. And also, if you are, uh, these jets are coming at your direction, it will be Doppler boosted and you'll see a radio loud AGN and so on. So, uh, as you can see, this is the spectra of <clears throat> NGC 5548 and NGC 1667. The first one is uh, type 1 cipher or type 1 AGN. And this one is type 2 cipher or type 2 AGN. Okay, now let's talk about this changing look AGNs that I'm going to uh, I'm here to talk about. So changing look AGNs are the AGNs, which is a relatively rare subclass of AGNs and only a few dozens of them have been invented so far, right? So there are two types of it and why they are changing look. Changing look means they are changing their types from type one to type two or vice versa within months time scale or years time scale. So this is what makes it unique. Because if you study the viscous time scale of AGNs, the duty cycle of AGNs is of the order of 20 or five years, usually. So you don't expect any changes uh, within uh, months or years time scale. But that is what is happening for these AGNs and that's what makes them unique. Now, there are two types of uh, changing look AGNs that we have detected so far. And uh, first of them is changing obscuration. And the second one is changing accretion state. So changing obscuration, as you can imagine from the name, it means that there is a medium which is blocking our view 
and its column density, which is mostly hydrogen. So its column densities are getting higher or lower within months or years time scale. And for the changing accretion state, it means there is a change in the accretion rate. So that means the luminosity getting higher because of some events have happened. Maybe there is a tidal disruption event, which is basically a star or planet, whatever is trapped within the black hole and it's torn apart. And this providing huge amount of matter within a few time, years time scale. And that's why the accretion rate gets higher. So yes, we have seen in months time scale. And I'm gonna talk about that in 20th, 1927. So uh, this is uh, what is happening here. As you can see, this is the unobscured part of the agent spectra. And if there is obscuration, so basically when you are uh, doing the spectral analysis, you will get a huge column density of the order of 10 to the power 24 per centimeter square or 10 to the power five sometimes. And usually uh, for normal agents, we see this column density of the order of 10 to the power 21 or 20 at least. So uh, this is what happens for unobscured and obscured uh, part of the obscured spectra of the agents. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, changing accretion state. And what happens here is the broadline region, which is close to the supermassive black hole, it gets illuminated. And that's why the broad emission line, which was not visible initially, comes to life, as you say. And we are seeing these broad emission lines happening or uh, reappearing sometimes within months time scale. So let's talk about this uh, changing obscuration first. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I'm gonna show you some examples. For example, this is uh, taken from Ricci et al. paper, which is a recent paper. We can go through this. And uh, this is a type one AGN initially, and the name is ESO323 minus uh, G7719. And it showed, as you can see here, uh, I hope this is visible. This is 2010. The green one is 2010, April 2010. Black one is 2006, February 2006. And these are the obscured spectra. So as you can see here, uh, the FE emission line, which was not visible initially because of uh, this uh, emission part, the soft axis part was present there. Now, when this obscuration is happening, there is a column, a medium, which is absorbing this uh, soft part, this F emission is really prominent now. So this is mostly because of uh, medium, which is uh, uh, basically eating all the emission below uh, 5 keV here. And as you can see, these changes that we are talking about happen within years time scale, right? So it's 2010 from this green one, and in the, the blue one is 2011. So it's within one year, you see this type of difference. And uh, which is also shown here, the column density, as you can see, this is the year uh, times, sorry. So yes, it's going, it's showing exactly, it's going up and down. And it's all this happening within years time scale, which is really fascinating. So there is a medium and which is, I mean, there are several possibilities. For example, there is a clumpy torus because, uh, so there is an idea that the torus itself, one part of it is going towards the supermassive black hole. And there is also idea of disk wind, which is basically a not non-collimated part of the disk, which is coming or evaporating from the disk and which is blocking our view. Uh, sometimes there is a failed jet. So there are different possibilities and uh, people you know, go through different observations and they find uh, different explanations for all of these things. So uh, this is uh, an example of search. There's the column density as you can see here, and it shows um, severe, type of changes within a year's a month's time scale, actually, as you can see here. So uh, this is what, yes, this is ESO, no, this is the NGC 1068, this is a different one. Yeah, this is uh, in a month's time scale. And this is a year's time scale, this is month's time scale. And this is uh, done using new star observations. New star is a uh, X-ray telescope, which covers up to 50 kV and which is very essential to detect the column densities. So we need to constantly, as you can see here, if we don't have this part in the extra spectra, we need the higher energy bands to constrain those spectral parameters, right? So that's why NISTAR is a space-based telescope, extra telescope, which is uh, really important in uh, finding these changing obscuration type AGMs. Yes. 
Yeah. No, no, no. Continuum is not changing. It's the obscuration. We are talking about the medium. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, 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 no. Line emission is not changing because we are we are expecting this to happening from the outer part of the disk. So this should not change. Because if emission lines change, as you can see, the line strength is not changing very much. Yes, it's not changing because uh, this F emission, this narrow F emission line, we expect them to be originating from the outer part of the disk, from the torus. So this should not change. So whatever change is happening in between the torus and the central supermassive black hole. Yeah, that's why, yes, yes, yeah. No, no, F emission, Okay. Yes, you can. Yeah. No, it's not changing. And in the second one, what is the scale? What are the Actually, this is the, the gap between uh, years time scale. So this is in the month's time scale. In 2017 to 2018, there has been several observations. But there was a gap. So that part is shown in this vertical lines, two yeah. vertical lines. Yes, yes. Because it's of the order of, for example, this one, red one is 5 times 10 to the 24. And this one is 8 times 10 to the 24. So this makes a lot of change in the soft X-ray part. So when you're talking about, for example, this part, it's uh, around 2 kV region. So below 2 kV region, this will make a significant difference. But the red and green, mm -hmm. they are very different, right? In the optical Yes. But here are the red and green are... No, these are two different, two, two different objects. This is just shown that uh, in uh, the same thing is happening in Mons time scale. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. 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 Yeah, the feature is already there. This is a narrow information line is present in all these observations. No, the narrow information line we expect it's the parallel, the primary parallel continuum that is originating from the corona that is reflected from the outer part of the disk. So that's why this part is not changing. Whatever is happening is inside this region. That's the idea here. So it's not uh, actually inflicting any changes between this, uh, the neutral reflection from the outer part of the action disk. So we assume this uh, emission line, not emission line to be neutral reflection from the outer part of the disk or the torus, for example. So that's why this is not affected. The, the medium is not affecting the torus here. So whatever is happening should be, or is happening inside this, Torus region. A torus and the supermassive black hole, something is there, or the medium, or the absorbing medium is present in this region. Okay. Can you just, just wait? Can you just go back to where you showed the part where the X-ray spectrum? This one? Uh, not this. That in the beginning. Yeah, right. Mm. So here you're on the right hand side, the blue. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then magenta, there is another insected component. Yes. Among that, there is a line. So now you are saying that the, uh, the insected component is not really changing much, but the blue thing is coming down because of the obscuration, particularly in the low frequency. Yes. So, yes. So it, yes. Now there is there is two things here. Actually, there are two types of reflection. Now the soft excess part, for example, this part, which is most affected by this medium. This is the ionized reflection from the inner regions. And this F emission line, this is happening from the outer part of the disk, from the uh, torus. 
So that's why this part is not getting affected. Yes, sometimes in the torus because there people have found the correlation between this uh, the column density and the effusion line strength. So now there's I mean ideas that this may be originating from this outer part of the disk because this is affecting or the column density is, has a co strong correlation with this effusion lines. Yes, yes, yes. If you see the changes in this part, you will see able to, for example, how it is the origin, I mean, morphology. Sometimes people are talking about also the morphology, as I mentioned, because uh, people believe there is a clumpy torus, which is responsible for this obscuration. So there people actually measure this, uh, the position of the torus from the central region. And depending on it, for example, when you are seeing this variability, how much time it is taking place from, uh, you know, the optical change in the optical region and change in the outer part of the disk for the information lines. If there is a change within a year's time scale, so it means it will be around one per second or something like that. So that's the idea. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, let's talk about changing accretion state. Now, as I mentioned, this is a change in the accretion rate. And change in accretion rate means there is uh, accreted matters for in some form is uh, there is a tidal disruption event maybe which is providing this amount of uh, matter and which is uh, basically increasing the accretion rate. And when there is an accretion change in the accretion rate, we see some changes in the X-ray spectra. And most of the time we see a appearance or disappearance of the soft excess. As you previously mentioned, it is the uh, excess emission below 2 kV region. So as you can see here, the same thing is happening. Uh, there are uh, observations from 2018 to 2019. These are two examples. On the left-hand side, this is Mercury N1018. And on the right-hand side, we have NGC 1566. Now, these are two examples of changing accretion uh, state AGNs, where people have found the presence of soft excess when it was highly luminous or the accretion rate was higher. And when accretion rate was lower, this soft excess part was gone. So this is termed, uh, these are the examples of changing accuracy rate or state agents. And yeah, this is uh, fitted with, uh, uh, they have used actually two corona model. So uh, this is Noda and Dunn, Chris Dunn et al. They have published this paper. Uh, I think, no, this is NGC 1566. This is Tripathi et al. This is Gulab Devangan and Tripathi et al. They have studied this. Uh, using uh, AstroSat and XMM. And this one is uh, Noda and Dunn et al. So these are the observations when the action rate was higher and the soft access was present. And they have used a two corona model. So th they don't believe in the reflection models. And uh, in these two corona model, the it is two corona. Basically, one part is responsible for this soft access and another part is responsible for the parallel continuum. So in the reflection scenario, there is one corona which is uh, providing the parallel continuum and it's also getting uh, reflected from the ionized accretion disk and producing the soft excess. But here, this is uh, another corona, which is they call this warm corona, which is the temperature is basically lower of the order of 0 0.1 kV, 0 0.2 kV. And this is producing the uh, uh, this soft excess part of the soft excess part. These are just models. No, no, I'm just showing the base fit models. These are base fit models. Optics agent, yes. They have used optics agent, but optics agent is also a form of two corona model, basically. Okay. So uh, as you can see here, uh, the takeaway point is that do we see a presence of soft excess in the uh, 2kV region for when the accretion rate is higher? And uh, this part is gone when the accretion rate is lower. And this happens, as you can see, within years time scale again, which should not happen usually. Now, uh, which is also evident from this plot, which is uh, taken from down at all. Now, as you can see here, this is the uh, uh, hardness ratio, uh, LH by LS plus LH. So, uh, and on the X axis, you get the accretion rate. So when this accretion rate is higher, as you can see, so it's basically a high soft and low hard transition that we usually see in binaries. So they what they uh, try to say that this is basically similar to the extra binaries where we see a high soft to low hard transition. 
so the spectra becomes uh, hard and uh, when this uh, the luminosity is low and the spectra becomes soft when the luminosity is high and which is also uh, quite fixed in this picture that we have here now uh, let's this is uh, now i'm going to talk about markian 590 which uh, is the first unique case of changing location which doesn't quite fit into these two scenarios so Markian 590 is a very interesting source which has shown the presence of broad Bauman emission lines periodically. In a sense, in a decade's time scale, the presence of broad emission lines appeared and disappeared. And uh, as you can see here from 73 to 2014, January, these are the light curves. And as you can see, the broad emission lines have appeared and disappeared over this time period. So this is a unique. AGN from that perspective also. But what is also interesting is that the soft X-ray part that I previously mentioned, that was present in 2004 and it completely vanished in the latest observations. So we expect that the change in the accretion rate is responsible for this, right? Because we already seen in Mercurian 1018 and NGC 1566, that happened, same thing happened when the soft texture was there, the accretion rate was higher. But here, interestingly, as you can see on the top panel here, this is the soft texture flux. And these are the parts where the soft texture excess was present. And just now look at the accretion rate. Now, this is the lambda Eddington, which is basically the uh, L volumetric and accretion rate the ratio of the L volumetric and the L Eddington. So as you can see here, there is no correlation. Now, the soft texture part was present in these two observations, the first two observations. And in the latest observations, which is Neustar and Swift, we use Neustar and Swift observations, the soft X-ray axis was still gone. We didn't detect any soft X-ray emission. But as you can see here, the accretion rate was higher. So this is a unique case of a changing mode AGM Yes. Uh, Eddington ratio you can get from uh, simple assumptions. Yeah, I mean, we have to estimate L volumetric. A mass we used previously, a uh, mass that measured mass, reverberation mapping. Yeah, there are errors. Actually, it's not quite visible, but there are errors in Lambda Eddington. Yes. I mean, we see the same amount of accretion rate in the 2004 and in the 2018, this is 2018 observation, the accretion rate is of the uh, same order, but we don't see any soft X-ray excess. And as you can see here, uh, there is no correlation between the soft X-rays. Now, as I mentioned, there are two scenarios that explains this soft X-ray emission. One of them is reflection, and another one is two corona or the optics agent. Now, we expect a correlation. If these two scenarios are true, then we expect a correlation between the soft X-ray and the power law, because as you can see, the power law is getting illuminated by the ionized accretion disk. So there must be some correlation between the power law and the soft X-ray part, right? So if power law is, I mean, higher flux is getting higher, we expect a change and the higher soft X-ray flux. And if the two corona model is true, then the UV part, because in the two corona model, the UV seed photons are responsible for the soft X-ray. So in uh, reflection scenario, we expect a correlation between the power law and the soft X-ray. And if the two corona model is true, we expect a correlation between the UV and the soft X-ray. But as you can see here, uh, this is um, the power law flux, and this is the UV flux. And as you can see, the soft X-ray part is gone even when the UV and the hard X-ray flux is high. So this is a unique case where we don't know what actually is responsible for the origin of this soft X-ray emission. And uh, we also uh, studied all these, we have eight observations uh, spanning from 2004 to 2020. And all these observations, we have plotted this uh, alpha OX, which is basically the slope between the UV and the X-ray, which basically tells us about the disk, accretion disk and the coronal relations, how they're interacting with each other. And this uh, line that you see here, this is the Lusso et al. paper uh, from uh, taken from Lusso et al. paper where they have studied 
AGN samples of AGNs at different rate shifts, at different accretion rates, and they have found this relation between the uh, alpha waves, which is the uh, spectral slope between the optical UV and the X-ray, and the UV monochromatic luminosity. And as you can see here, the, the observations that we have here doesn't follow this disk corona relations for normal AGNs, and which is also true for uh, the gamma and the log of lambda adhesion, which is basically uh, gamma is representative of the corona and also its cooling and heating mechanisms. And this lambda adhesion is the accretion rate. And again, you see uh, the uh, expect at least a correlation or anti correlation between these two. Which people have found, Bradman et al. and Kao et al. they have found for different HN samples, but our observations doesn't quite fit into these pictures. Oh. Yes, that's the slope between the. Yes, yes. Point zero. Mm -hmm. No, this is mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. I mean, we expect, yeah, but this is significant. I mean, we expect as we expect an alpha x of a similar values. So, what I mean to say is the UV and the X-ray, if there is a correlation between these two, then we expect this spectral slope to be behave the similar way. So right? The question is, let's say mm -hmm. you have plotted it at 1.16. Yes. What is the uncertainty of that? Oh, uncertainty is within this very small because we are talking so about... Yes, I understand. It's not. It's very small. That's what I'm saying. Because we need, this is the ratio between the UV flux and the X-ray flux. Okay, so um, these are the, uh, again, the as I previously mentioned that we expect a correlation between the soft axis and the UV and the soft axis and the lambda Eddington. If the uh, assumption that the accretion rate is higher and the soft axis is present there. So uh, we don't see that here because in observation one and two, we can clearly see the soft axis was present, but the accretion rate is going all over the place here. So when even when the accretion rate is higher, we don't see the soft axis, even when the accretion rate is lower, we don't see the soft axis. And we don't see a correlation between the soft axis and the UV. So the idea that uh, the core two corona model that uh, Noda and Don et al. and the Tripadi et al. they have found that there is a correlation between the accretion rate and the presence of soft axis is not holding true here. Okay, uh, let's now talk about the second object, 1ES 1927 plus 654. Now this is another changing look Asian where the presence of broad emission line, this has appeared, it was a true type two Asian because we don't see any um, column density of the order of 10 to 24 here, but still we don't see any broad emission line in the optical spectrum. But in 2017, the December 2017, people have found the presence of broad uh, spectra, uh, broad emission lines in the optical spectra. And uh, the interesting part here is that for the first time, we see that the coronal emission that the power law continuum, you speak that above, which dominates above 2 keV band, was completely gone after 200 days. So when there was an emission, uh, the change in the accretion rate or change in the luminosity in 20, December 2017. In 2018, April, around 2018, April, we see the coronal emission was completely gone and we only detected an upper limit. So this is the first time actually this type of phenomena have happened when the corona has completely gone or vanished. Now, initial uh, studies, they have the Benny Trackenbot et al. and Richie et al. They have studied the source and they have found that maybe this is because of a tidal disruption event. And for tidal disruption events, what happens is that 
the optically we light curve which follows a typical t to the minus five by three type of curve and they have studied up to uh, this part which is uh, 2018 december and they concluded that it's falling like t to the minus five by three almost t to the minus five by three so it must be a tidal disruption event but interesting thing is that for a tidal disruption event we don't expect the corona to completely gone or vanish or the parallel continuum to be completely gone. This doesn't happen or never happened in any change in occasions. But in one year, 1927, we followed up this with optical, UV, radio, and X-ray. And we see something like this. So initially, uh, now let me explain this each column. So this uh, horizontal line or each column is the pre-flare value. So this is the X7 Newton observations from 2011. And we set the benchmark there that that's where the agent was before this change in loop or these dramatic changes happened. Now, as you can see, uh, initially it was very close to this pre flare value. Then uh, the X-ray was completely gone, as you can see, which is shown by this uh, triangles, inverted triangles. Then it came up, the corona was forming, then it was quite high, almost 30 or 40 times higher than the pre-flare values. Now, then again, it's coming back to its initial values or pre-flare values. The UV is completely uncorrelated. As you can see, the UV uh, is, oh, sorry, this is the soft X-ray part, which is 0 0.3 to 2 kV. This is also happening, uh, going up and down, but follows a similar trend. This is the hardness ratio, which is basically the ratio of the soft and hard X-ray. And this is the UV part. Now, as you can see, uh, Benny and Trachtenbord and Rich et al. they have studied up to this part. So their spectra was relatively steeper, but our is much narrower. It follows to go minus 0 0.9, which is much shallower than initially predicted. And interestingly, when you studied the radio observation, you see that the radio emission was quite low compared to the pre flight values. Now, this is quite interesting because we don't expect the radio to change much because it is a radio quite Asian. So all of this kind of indicates that this is this may not be a tidal disruption event. And so for a tidal disruption event, there is some other aspects. For example, we expect some broad emission lines in the optical spectra if it is a main sequence star. For example, if it is a main sequence star, it gets disrupted by the uh, central supermassive black hole, it uh, holds some elements that should be there in the main sequence star, right? So we expect certain broad emission lines in the spectra, but that was these emission lines were missing in the spectra. And also uh, this radio emission that is, uh, we detected quite low, this type of behavior was quite unique. And the most interesting part as already mentioned is the X-ray, the corona part, which was there's no coronal emission for a certain period for almost 150 to 200 days. Now, this never happened. Now, these three scenarios, we um, we are kind of puzzled what is actually happening. So we uh, kind of, um, we collaborated with some theoreticians, went to them and they came up with an idea that, uh, okay, so just before that, this is the tidal disruption curve that usually follows, uh, but we didn't detect that. We used different curves, Python analysis and of sorts. We fitted this model over and over again. We assumed the initial uh, luminosity changes with the time period from plus minus 20 days to plus 20 days and all sorts of things. And still we found the base fit is to the minus 0 0.9 and uh, kind of proves that this is not a tidal disruption event. This is the optical spectra. This is uh, from 2011 and this is from 2019, and we see the broad emission lines are completely gone. There are only narrow emission lines present. So whatever illuminated the borderline region, that event that happened, uh, happened and nothing else is going on right now. And uh, this is the spectra at different phases. And this, you can see, this is the part where the corona was completely gone. We don't see a spectra, only upper limits. And there are some phases, the initial phase or high soft state, where the soft emission, for example, this part, as you can see here, the soft X part was quite high. There was hard X part was quite high. This is the S14A. This is the part where 
this is the point we are talking. This is S fourteen A. So here, as you can see, both soft and hard S row was quite high, and this is shown by this magenta S fourteen A. And there are certain phases where the soft X ray part was relatively lower compared to the peripheral values, and the hard X ray part was completely gone. So again, we try to find some correlation between the soft and hard X ray part, which is the usual practice to find any correlation between the soft and hard X-ray, soft and the UV. And we didn't detect any such correlations. Now, this is the part from the initial observations. And on the right-hand side is the part from our latest shift observations that we, the paper we have submitted. And as you can see here, there is no correlation on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, this is the soft and the hard X-ray flux. And we see a very strong correlation now. Right, so there must be something that has dramatically changed between this period. And again, this are uh, the alpha waves, the spectral slope, and the monochromatic luminosity, and the alpha waves and the variation of the alpha waves over the time period. As you can see, alpha waves was very high, so which means this is very soft in the initial stage. Then it came back from its uh, come back to its preflare values, and now it's coming back. As you can see on the right hand side, this is going down, which means it's again becoming very soft. So the alpha waves basically gives you an idea how the UV, the optical UV part and the X-ray part, they are collaborating or interacting with each other. And as you can see here, again, the soft X-ray part is getting, the flux in the soft X-ray part is getting higher. And this is the radio analysis. And uh, we found an interesting thing here, and that is the goodell bench relation. Now, this is the relation that usually found in uh, coronally active stars. So where we assume that the radio and the X-ray is coming from the same region. And since uh, we do not, as you previously shown in this figure, the radio emission was very low uh, here. So we tried what it did. We measured the ratio of the X-ray flux and the radio flux. And we see that it follows the same relation that we usually found in coronally active stars. So which it basically means is that the corona may be responsible for the emission of the radio and the X-ray part, or the magnetic field that is holding together this corona, which is emitting the, in the radio or responsible for this radio emission and also responsible for the X-ray emission. And there may be some correlation between these two. So uh, if in summary, as you can see, it may not be a tidal disruption event. Uh, it doesn't quite follow the typical disk corona relation that we see in normal AGNs. Now, no correlation between the soft and hard X-ray. There is no correlation between the soft and the UV. And uh, the X-ray and radio flux follow the goodell bench relations. So when we uh, talked to the theoreticians, they came up with an idea that maybe it is an intrinsic flux inversion. So what it basically means that there is a flux inversion in the accretion disk. Now, how this magnetic field is introduced, we do not know. We believe that it is an intrinsic process, which happens in sun, for example. Sun changes its magnetic, uh, there is a magnetic reversal in spole in 11 year circle. Uh, in Earth, it has happened uh, over a million years, I think. So we have, uh, we believe that it had happened in this agent. And when this inverted or uh, this magnetic flux that is accumulated and coming up from the uh, outer part of the disc to the inner part of the disc, it destabilized the corona. And the corona, the flux of the corona is completely gone because the corona is getting destroyed by this opposite polarity. And when this uh, corona is completely gone, the coronal emission is gone, and that's why the parallel vanished. And now the corona, when it's formed up again with the reverse polarity, now we see a change in the uh, X-ray part, the parallel continuum emission, and the parallel emission is come back, and now it's initial, come back to its initial pre-flare values. So this is the theoretical picture. So this is the pre-flare values, and uh, the idea is that the accretion rate is depending on both this magnetic flux or the magnetic flux inversion and the accretion rate. 
So the UV part is responsible for the accretion rate and the coronal part is depending on both accretion rate and this magnetic flux. So that's why when the magnetic flux is gone, the coronal emission is going down. And when it came back with a reverse polarity, the corona is forming up and the extra flux is coming back to its nuclear values. So this is the picture that we have here. So uh, as you can see, this is the pre-flare picture in 2011. There is a north and south pole, and then there is a magnetic flux inversion happening in outer part of the accretion disk. And uh, this is destabilizing the corona in August 2018. The corona is completely gone. The coronal emission, the power law emission is completely gone. And then when this corona is formed back again to its initial stages, now the accretion rate is high, so the flux is high. But when the accretion rate is going back to its initial stage, the power of flux has gone down to its pre-flare values. So this is the picture that we have, and uh, this is a conjecture, of course. And we believe that this may have happened instead of a cattle disruption event. And uh, this was part of a NASA press release, and uh, there was a beautiful video I would like to show you, but I don't think it will be. Uh, but just uh, let me finish with uh, the latest observations that I previously mentioned. So uh, these are the latest observations that we have here. And as you can see, there is again the soft extra part, as I previously mentioned, the soft extra part is going up again. We do not see any change in the UV. But the hard extra part is almost similar the, compared to the pre flare values, but the soft extra part is going up. Now we do not know what is the origin of the soft X-ray excess because it doesn't quite fit into the pictures that we have, the accepted picture, of course. So this is uh, the observations that we have. This is the VLBA observations in radio. And interestingly, the radio observation that was coming back to its pre-flare values, now again going down when the soft X-ray part was up. So there must be some correlation between the soft X-ray and the radio, but we do not know what is happening here. And uh, this is uh, the same picture, but as you can see more clearly, this is the soft X-ray part, which is going up consistent manner. The hard X-ray is almost consistent. There is no change in UV. So as you mentioned, the picture that we have in mind, the reflection of the two corona model, that doesn't quite fit in here. And uh, so these are all that we have. And I would like to show you the uh, video here. and. Thank you. Thank you, boys. Thank you. At the end of 2017, a galaxy 236 million light years away began a rare and dramatic transformation. It's an event astronomers are still puzzling over one set off by changes near its central black hole. They first explained... Sound to the audio to? Audio to the audio to the start. So this is the media team of NASA. They have came up with this idea and they made a very beautiful picture animations. And I hope this will explain a lot of things that I couldn't see.
X-rays from the galaxy dim. By August 2018, the higher energy X-rays have disappeared completely. A few months later, the high energy X-rays came back even brighter than before. They return to normal within a year. These X-rays come from a cloud of super hot particles near the black hole. It is a feature called the corona, which is formed by the strong magnetic field. The lack of higher energy X-rays means that the structure was essentially gone. Based on observations from SWIFT, Europe's Exxon satellite, and ground-based optical and radio telescopes, here's what may have happened. The visible energy trail results from the flow of matter into the black hole and increases. This may have started when the magnetic field in the outer regions began to flip. The weakened magnetic field can no longer support the corona, which vanishes. The flipped magnetic field gains strength, restoring the extra corona, but the inward flow of matter is still high, so this emission is stronger than it was before the flare. Finally, the corona and the return to their state of performance. Now, the first magnetic field. Rapid changes in UV and visible light have only been observed in a few dozen of the galaxy by this point. So this is the first time I see the scene and drop out as an upgraded light of brightness. These surprising events are the tantalizing events as the extreme forces of work near an actively hidden. Thank you. Okay, I have some questions because uh, we have one more topic for the talk. So, Current state is we are trying to uh, find out the strength, to be honest. Yeah. We are trying to find out the correlation between the soft X-ray axis and uh, the magnetic field strength, which is holding up the corona. Because as you can see, there is a correlation between the, the soft X-ray flux is going up and the, the radio is going down. So, and there is no change in the UV. So if there is no change in the UV, so you expect that the uh, chromatic luminosity should not change, the accretion rate is not changing, right? So uh, must be there must be something else that is powering out these soft stresses. So we believe now we believe that maybe the magnetic field which is holding up the corona is, is also responsible for these soft stresses. So we are trying to find out the energetics. So uh, for example, the magnetic field strength which would be uh, responsible for this amount of energy emissions in the X-rays. So what we are doing now is we trying to, you know, as you can see, there is a com it's constant slope in the upward directions. So we are trying to calculate the energy that is required for the soft X-ray emission, and also the magnetic field strength and the magnetic field energy that will be required, or which is to be responsible responsible for this amount of energy. And if that matches up, then we can say, okay, maybe the magnetic field is responsible for the soft X-ray. I think what yeah, that's why. Corona time scale is, I mean, Corona is very, people have found in short time scale very beautiful Corona. On a magnetic field, I mean, we believe it's an intrinsic process that's similar to the sun, but we don't know for sure, right? I mean, this is just a conjecture for right now. We cannot say that this is what exactly happened and uh, this will happen in a certain period. We need more observations. So if you see, for example, three or four observations similar to this, then only, only then we'll be able to kind of confirm that, okay, this is what exactly is happening here, or maybe that happens at, for all agents at a certain phase. So at this point, we cannot say much that, okay, this is this is a time, I mean, we cannot compare the time scale, right? So at this moment, it will be a, a lot of saying okay, without, without any evidence. So yeah, if you see a lot of observations like that, then sure. <clears throat> Very nice talk. We got to learn a lot of new things. So I know 
question regarding the new uh, changing of duration part, uh, which is two part basically. So, in how many sources actually you have uh, seen this uh, changing of duration part? Is it for the uh, only one source? No, no. Changing of duration, there are two types of changing locations, as I mentioned. And uh, right now we have a couple of dozens of them, but the number is growing because. Okay. Uh, initially, we did not have any all sky monitoring going on. Okay. Right now, we have uh, several facilities which are doing that. And that's why we are getting triggering information. For example, there is a certain change in the luminosity in the optical and so on. So when you have information in the optical part, so you have, uh, you know, there are proposals where people have kind of, you know, if they see a triggering event in the optical, we will uh, start monitoring in the x-rays. So that's how you get uh, the number is going up. Right now we have around 30s of changing locations, number is around 30. And changing obscuration is relatively lower compared to the changing accretion state. Yeah, that's uh, but uh, I am aware of seven of such sources, yeah, but uh, the number maybe have grown up recently. I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not an expert of changing obscuration. That's a completely different thing, ball game altogether. Okay. So, so maybe I'm uh, because we have already uh, seven sources, but maybe I'm thinking in a wrong direction. So I was actually wondering if uh, so I saw that uh, the observation is for a different uh, telescope like uh, Swing, uh, Sudraku, and uh, Sandra maybe. So I was wondering if the any uh, orientation effect, but if we consider uh, uh, an isotropic product. So, uh, if there is any orientation effect, is uh, responsible for this? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's an idea, right? I mean, because when you're talking about the clumpy torus, yes. it basically keeps uh, that's what you're saying. I'm kind of saying because yeah, clumpy said, torus, yeah, 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 please go on. No, no, I just oh. uh, I didn't you that. Yeah, I mean, so this is uh, an idea that just you mentioned. This is one of the ideas that may be responsible for the changing obscuration because changing obscuration means the column density has changed. For the absorbing medium, the column density has changed due to some effect. Now, it can be the torus, it can be something inside that. For example, this may be, as I mentioned, some uh, disk wind, which is not there, but some uh, after some evaporation effect, there is disk wind, which is blocking our view. There may be some failed jet. For example, there is a jet, you know, we believe this uh, jets are responsible, I mean, they are created by this black hole spin uh, and the magnetic field and collimination effects are there. But sometimes these jets do not launch and sometimes these materials that is accumulated, this is blocking our view. So these are the ideas that uh, we have right now and uh, responsible for these changing of solutions. So uh, I hope answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. So, can you just go to the slide where it shows like the spectrum for the changing accretion state? Like oh. the double hump spectrum. Let me. Okay. Peter. <laughs> Which one? Done it. This one, this one or? This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is that I see like over the several time periods, I see the half the synchrotron peak is like. No, no, this is not synchrotron peak. This is only X ray part. Okay. So this is the okay. soft X ray part. This is the soft X ray part. Okay. So this is a zero point, usually 0 0.3 to 2K. Depending yes, on or below two K region. Yes, so I was the one that the one peak is the first peak and the second peak is roughly staying at the same like the yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point because the second peak is, for example, as I mentioned, this is the Compton part. Yes, but both peaks should right. So the second peak is the same. You're talking about this one, right? Yeah, I mean this that one. That yeah. one is not shifting very much compared to the first one. So this is the Compton hump. So yeah. this is the part that has previously mentioned. This is, we expect this to be originating from the outer part of the disk or the torus. Yeah. So this is stable part. 
So this, we should not, I mean, we don't expect this to be moving or anything like that. So we okay. expect a similar type of class or, I mean, same spectra or the same, uh, for example, the same type of hump, or strength in the hump, is, it should be similar. We don't expect any variation at that part. Okay. Or even if there is a variation, it should be on a longer time scale. Okay. So that's true. Thanks. Okay, uh, RC. So, I think I have a question the same thing. So, um, so, what part of the of your observation could not be matched with this design? That is, you know, nothing special is happening, just the accretion state is changing. So, how, so why not in, in this scenario, the accretion rate and the soft excess flux or the strength is correlated. So if the accretion rate is going up, the soft excess flux is going up. But in, in our case, for market 590 or 20 years, 2017, even when the accretion rate is, I mean, for market 590, as we say, the accretion rate is almost the similar values in this part. Let me show you here. So the accretion rate is almost the same, but we don't see any soft phase excess. The soft phase excess is gone, it never reappeared, but the accretion rate is going up. So there is no correlation between these two, which is expected from uh, the two corona model or uh, two corona origin of the two corona. But if, if whatever scenario you, uh, you know, describe, that should also disrupt the disk quality. That, that should, it's not just the corona that will be affected. The, the magnetic fields are threaded to the disk. Mm -hmm. No, so, but it's uh, yeah, of course it's a magnetically adjusted disk. So it's uh, no longer it. I mean, we don't expect it to hold the alpha disk or the thin disk model. It should not be there. So it's kind of actually goes on with our idea that if there is a magnetic flux inversion, it should be a magnetically adjusted disk, the mat as they call it, and the magnetic field should be of the order of. I mean, for example, uh, as I mentioned, that's the person Dang at all. They have. Uh, recently published a paper, and they have uh, uh, there is a uh, estimation, and when we put our values for one year's nineteen twenty seven, we find a magnetic field of the order of ten to the power four gauss, so which is remarkably higher. We don't expect this amount of magnetic field for an AGN. It should be much lower. So uh, in a disk which is uh, dominated by this amount of magnetic field, we should not expect any correlation between these two. It, as I mentioned, it should be disrupted. So, but that's not the case for Mark and 590. I'm talking about one year's time to this, I think. For Mark and 590, we don't see the correlation because um, there isn't any. We should get our correlation here at least because there is, it's not like the corona was gone or the you, there is no correlation between any of these parts. So, Mark and 590 and one year's 1927 are two different pictures. One year's 1927, there is magnetic flux inversion. And because uh, we, I mean, we are promoting magnetic flux inversion because the corona was gone. But for Martian 519, nothing of sort that had happened. I mean, it was just the soft X ray axis was gone, and that's all. It never appeared, reappeared. So that's quite different from one year's 1927. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Ritesh. Uh, let's thank have a speaker. For this nice talk, and then there is another talk which is being organized by the Student Science Club, which starts at four o'clock, and the speaker is uh, Professor Shomitra Shen Gupta. So, yeah. so the thing is that uh, yeah, it's being it's being advertised as AKR uh, centenary talk. AKR centenary means this is the centenary birth year.